Welcome everyone to the session, one of the sessions after lunch. It's always the most difficult ones, I know, because we've got full stomach. I hope you ate good um, during the lunch and uh, for the next few minutes, about 40, 45 minutes, we will talk about Angular and forms and validation with Angular in particular. I'm very proud and honored that this is an Angular talk at this conference. I don't know if there uh, was an Angular talk before this conference, so I'm really, really glad to be here. And uh, on top of that is one of the uh, in-person conferences, one of the first in-person conferences after the pandemic. So not after the pandemic, I know it's not over, but I'm very, very glad that we see each other in person, that we can uh, talk to each other. I'll fix my mic a bit. I think this is better. All right, thank you very much. So for the next 45 minutes, we will talk about Angular and forms and validation with Angular. Basically, that's the topic we will um, put a focus on. And although I can barely see you, but who of you is using Angular and forms in particular in his current project? Please, please raise your hand. Oh, that's a lot, that's a lot, perfect. Who has never heard anything of Angular and Angular forms? One, two, three, okay, all right. So I think there should be uh, something in this talk for every one of you, hopefully. If not, if you've got any questions, please just hit me up in the, uh, in the hallway after the talk. I'm glad to answer all of them, if I can. Before we start, let me introduce myself. My name is Fabian. I'm a Google Developer Expert for Angular and Web Technologies. I'm also a Microsoft MVP. I know, I know this is normally Java conference, I know, but I'm a Microsoft MVP, a Pluralsight author. Uh, you can look up um, a course I did about Angular if you want to. Um, I'm working for a company which is called Offering Solution Software. We uh, do specialize on ASP.NET Core and Angular solutions. And uh, please see my Twitter handle uh, um, down in the corner. You can reach me there if you want to. You will get all the slides, all the examples. Um, if we have time for one, you will get those um, at the end of the talk, also on my Twitter account, so that's no problem. All right, first of all, before we start with Angular Forms, you have to know that there are two types of forms Angular provides you. Uh, it's not that one is better than the other, it's just that I'm more a fan of one of them. So first of all, we have the template-driven forms, and a second one is the reactive forms. So what's the difference? So the template-driven forms is more that you come with a forms template and you guide your forms through your HTML template, right? Uh, you, you, you put everything in the template like you know it, like you would do it with HTML forms, and then you just sync the changes through a directive which is called ng-model back to your TypeScript file. So this is how they stay in sync. So it's more template-driven. The reactive forms part is basically well, it's not the same, but don't think that you have not to pay attention for the templates in reactive forms. Of course, we have to display the forms we are designing to the user. This includes all the HTML tags, so we have to do uh, HTML as well, so they have a template, but they are more reactive in a way that we design them in the code, and we have like a rich API, an affluent API, where we can work with the Angular forms, and this makes it very, very easy to test them, and it makes it very, very easy to work with and this is why I'm a big fan of Angular Reactive Forms, and this is also the form part where we will focus on today. Before we dive into the code and before we see how the Reactive Forms work in particular, let's first um, spend a few seconds on why we should take care about forms. So I'll tell you a little story um, just to clarify that question. I, was, I wanted to go to, to England with my wife like and we were at the airport and we wanted to like check in and just get the, get our luggage done and and we were standing there and the guy behind the desk said okay i need i need this paper from you and i need uh, the travel allocators form and i need this and i need this and i need this and your passport and stuff like that because traveling was very hard during the pandemic you know and we said, we, we have a luggage, of course we have a passport but what is a travel allocators form what what do we have to do there right and he said, if you want to travel to England, you have to fill out that particular form. And in the end, you will get a QR code, or you, you will get kind of uh, um, like, like that you did everything correct, and you can give me that, like a receipt, and you can give me that, and then I will see that everything was correct. So of course, we did not do this, right? So with our mobile phones, we just went to a Starbucks because we had Wi-Fi there, and uh, we tried to fill out this um, travel allocators form. You know, and it's, it, it was a form, basically. But it was so hard to fill out the form 
on a mobile device. It was it was huge. It was not like the Swiss one, which has like I don't know four or five inputs, but in England it was like a hundred thousands of inputs with different fields, and we had really had to 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 get in our bloodline like I don't know how th ten thousand generations after us and stuff like that. So it was a tremendous amount of information we had to provide in order to get the receipt in order to fly to England. So that was one of the examples where I realized that doing forms and doing forms in a way that we users like to fill them out is incredibly hard. You know, I mean, let's break it down, just validate a telephone number. That's, that's, that's a tremendous amount of work if you want to do it well. They are complete libraries just specializing on how to format a telephone number. A plus in front, if you've got the international format, a zero, zero. Where do you do the spaces? Do you do spaces, right? So everybody puts his uh, telephone number in a different format into this field, you know. So doing forms is very, very hard. And why is it hard? Um, because everybody is, like, like I said, is doing it differently. Everybody understands forms differently in, in the input, right? And you always have to keep in mind that if you do in a form, if you display a form to your user, it's the first time he has to, to take his hand off his mouse and really work for you, work for your application. So you make your users work. So we have, as a developers, we have to make it as easy as possible to get the data from the users, right? So registering yourself in your portal, in your whatever you do in your product, it should be like username and password, and boom, you're in. So that should be it, basically. I don't want to fill out a thousand pages form like the travel allocators form I had to do when traveling to England, right? So it should be as easy as possible. So always keep in mind it should be as easy as possible if you're doing Angular, uh, if you're doing forms. And uh, I think Angular reactive forms really, really pay attention to that and it gets very, very easy if we want to if we want to work with this. So forms are really, really important. Always keep in mind users have to work for you maybe for the first time when they're using your product in your page. So this is why forms are very, very important. But let's dive into the code now. If we want to start with Angular Reactive Forms, I think you all have seen that. That's a normal app module. So um, what we have to do is we have to import the Reactive Forms module. The Reactive Forms module comes out of Angular Forms, which is with a new Angular product. It's there uh, by standard. So you can just import it and add it to your imports array. So the first import is the S6 import. Here we are telling our Angular application, hey, I want you to import everything this module export, and then I can use all the functionality you are providing me. Right? So we have to do both. The ECMAScript 6 import on line 2 for the type, and then I'm just provided to your Angular application. And if you are traveling along with Angular Forms, you will stumble upon uh, a control which is called the abstract control. And this is basically what the reactive forms are really, really about. It's one of the main concepts of Angular forms and basically everything tews down to that. Um, so if we understand that, we made a huge step. So the abstract control, surprise, surprise, is an abstract class, abstract control, if you dive into the source code of Angular, and it comes also out of Angular forms. And the abstract control is implemented in three different ways. So first of all, we have the form control, then we have the form group, and then we have the form array. Right? So these basic concepts are in Angular Reactive Forms. And if you understand all those three, it's easy for you to create Angular Forms which are maintainable, which are easy to read, and which the user can like fill out with ease. Right? So first of all, let's talk about the form control itself. So this is the first one I want to pay attention to. The first one is maybe the smallest part if you want to start with Angular Forms. So how does it look like? If we have like a component like this, the first thing we can do is we can import the form control, which is also coming from Angular Forms. Right? So now my component knows about the type. And after this, we can use like a normal input with the HTML API, which we have seen for many thousands of years, right? So normal input, and we enhance it with the directive form control, and we bind to it a property which is called name, right? So what, what this form control directive now does is, is just enhances the input and tries to sync it with the component with the form control, uh, which is called name. And this is a normal property here, and this is a new form control. We just newed it up, and there we have a new instance of a form control, right? This directive because that's nothing else than a directive, this form control, we, are, um, we can use because we imported the reactive forms module. Everything the reactive forms module exports, we have imported in our module, and therefore the form control directive is known here. Right? So that's happening behind the scenes. And now we're taking it, and we're binding on it, the form control, which we are exposing here uh, with a name, and we're just newing up with the new form control. 
right? So these two work together, right? They, they belong together, and everything what you type in into the input gets now reflected into the new form controls. So it's synced automatically for you, right? And not only that, um, that we have the value synced, we also have a rich API on that, right? So we can ask for maybe the status, the value, which is basically what you typed in, or the errors on that particular form control, if you want to. All those properties come from the abstract control, right? So here we can say, okay, what is the status uh, of this form control? Um, is it valid or is it invalid? The value is what you basically typed in, and the errors is maybe if it's required, maybe there's a required error or something. We will get to that when we are looking to validation, right? So this is one part of the rich API the abstract control provides us when we are working with the form control. Right? Everything is coming out of here. We have a lot of more properties when we are talking about the abstract control, right? We have the value, um, which is an any type. We will get to that later because that changes in the new version of Angular. We have the value type. Um, we have the status, uh, which is a valid, invalid. We have the valid or invalid properties here. We have if, if, if it's pending, disabled, or enabled. This is very important because we have this pending state as well. So um, there's a pending, disabled, enabled. Um, we have the errors. If there are errors on that particular form control, we can see if it's pristine, dirty, if, had, if it has been touched or if it's still untouched. So you can show error messages only when the user clicked in once, right? If he hasn't clicked or interacted with the control and uh, not a single time, you don't want to display any error messages to him. So that really depends on what you want to do in your project, but you have the possibility to do it. And what I personally like very much is the value changes and status changes, which is kind of like a reactive API. So if anybody types something into that control, we can a stream or we can register on that and basically if you want to implement a search or an autocomplete you can hang into that value changes dot and then subscribe to it and then just catch the values out and maybe fire an HTTP request or do what you want with it right so that's the form control let's take a look at the next one which is the form group right so the form group basically is nothing else than a container for those form controls, but it can also include form groups and it can also include form arrays, right? So things are getting a little bit different or a little bit complex here because a form group is basically just grouping form controls or other form groups and form arrays together and you can make your, your form components or your forms completely like a form group and then you can do a form control, a form control, then a form group, then another control, then an array or something like that. So you can build up your forms inside of your, of your code, which is very, very um, easy to do with those three um, form abstract implementations of, of the form. The main thing about the form group is that it gets serialized as an object, right? As a plain JavaScript object. So the value of the form group is basically just a plain JavaScript object with the properties on it, how you designed your forms with the form controls and the form groups and the form array and stuff like that. So it really depends on your project, but it gets serialized as an object with all the properties you have form controls for. And that makes it very, very easy to work with them, right? So let's take a look at this. Right, we have a form control and the form group imported here, which also comes from Angular form. And here we have the form tag. See, we have the form tag for the first time, as we have seen the form control. We did not work with the form tag. We did not use it there. You don't have to, right? The form control itself, at the smallest part, you can just put it in or throw it on an input. You can work with it. You can interact with that. Angular takes care about synchronizing the values then, right? But here, for the first time, we are having a form. We are adding the form group directive on it and binding to uh, it the my form group. And when there is an event, which is called ng submit, which is one of the um, ng prefix event which were left over from AngularJS. Um, maybe the older ones know AngularJS still, so there we had the ng stuff. So we have the ng submit here, and then we are calling the submit. So when the form gets submitted, the ng submit is uh, getting thrown, and we're calling the on submit method. And here we are inside that form group now, and here we have an input, and now we're using the form control name equals first name. Pay attention to that we are not using the form control here. Now we're using the form control name. So if you're inside of a form group, use the form control name, and otherwise uh, use the form control and bind to it. But now we are inside of the form group, and now we can use the form control name equals the first name, and here you can see how we create that form. So we make in a new form group, we're newing it up, and we're passing in an object, in the constructor, which has a property first name, and th this property first name is a new form control. And basically, that's it. This is how you design your forms inside of your TypeScript file, which makes it very easy for us to see what's going on. 
in the um, on submit, we just can console log maybe like this my form group get, and then we are getting the first name form control. So with the dot get method, which is also in the abstract control, we can navigate inside a form. So we can say, please give me that form control. You can also chain it with the dot syntax. So you can, if you have uh, if you have nested form groups, and you go to my form group dot form group one dot form group two dot form group three dot property order or abstract control, whatever you like. So you can can really really uh, go to a particular form control inside of your nested form group and get out the value in that particular way. Right? So that makes, makes it also very easy um, to see what's going on and um, also testing and the visibility, the readability in the code gets, gets improved. We don't have only the, the get method to navigate inside of forms and get particular form controls. We also have like register control and add control, right? So the register control is also updating the value and validity of the form. The add control just adds a new control to the forms at runtime. If you have like a like tags or something and the user can click, okay, I want to add another tag and you can another input where the user can put in his tag during runtime, right? So we have remove control. We can take out a control or we have a set control if you want to override a control. We also have like a set value, patch value, and reset, which is also coming from the abstract control. This is available on the control, on the group, and on the array, right? So the set value, you know, we have to pass in the complete value for the form you want to have it, right? So in normal use cases that you are um, um, showing the user a form, and in the background you're making an HTTP request, uh, if there is an existing one, like an existing user, you get the things back, and then you can say set value to that particular form, and the form gets updated with the value you just get from the back end, and then the user can change it and save it. So this would be a, a use case for this. The patch value is basically just if you want to, to patch some parts of that particular form, right? So the set value expects the complete object for the complete form, right? The patch value maybe just expects like one or two things you want to patch inside of your form's object. Right, you want to just to update a few things, so you don't have to pass the complete object, but just a few values. Reset is resetting everything to like um, uh, to null if you if you click that. So this is very very easy to do. Maybe if if somebody hit a search button, so you have a search bar, you hit search, you want to reset that thing, um, or to do, and you want to reset that input, you can do that by calling the reset method. If you want to get uh, to the value of the complete form group, you can always call get raw value. What get raw value does is it gives you back the complete value no matter what, right? So you will get a JSON where all the things which you have inside of your form are just being displayed and you can work further with it. In this case, it's first name and last name. What get raw value does not respect this if controls are disabled or enabled, right? So if you only want to have the particular stand of your form without the disabled controls, you can call the value, and basically that's the difference. So the value is the real value at runtime from your form without the disabled ones, right? But maybe the get raw value has everything in it, no matter if the controls are disabled or not. So please be careful with that. And again, the form group, as it um, implements abstract control, also has all these values. I don't want to go through them all again. I think we, we have seen it, but again, you can see if they're valid or not, if touched, untouched, pristine, dirty, and stuff like that. So it, it really provides it. Uh, just keep in mind you're on, on a form group level, right? So a form group is dirty if one of its child is, child is dirty. Right, so it, it always accumulates up. So you have to see that these things are matching. And sometimes when you're working with with form groups and form controls, out of experience, I can say it's keep in mind where on which level you are. We will get to that when we're looking at the at the errors which we can uh, put through a form controller through a form group. Right. So what we also can do is we can um, bind a button or with the disabled uh, property from a button to if the form is invalid. So this button should be uh, disabled when my form is invalid. Right, so please take care of that if you're doing this. This is a common, like uh, um, a common thing which you, which I'm seeing in a lot of projects. But please pay attention to that because if you do this, this button will also be enabled in the pending state. I mentioned the pending state earlier, right? So the pending state is when we have like asynchronous validation. So maybe sometimes you want to check if an email address is already given or username is already given or not. And during this time, when you're sending the HTTP request. And before it's coming back and during this time, the form is pending, right? And you don't want the button to be enabled when it's pending because you don't have any, any response yet, right? So please always work with the not valid and then you cover it like the pending set. This is a very important trick, uh, which you can do and it's very easy to do. 
all right, one thing I was really confused when I started with all the forms was the form builder thing. Um, we did see how we can create forms with the constructors I showed you, right? With the, with the new form group and, and new form control and stuff like that. But there's another kit in town which is called the form builder. And the form builder basically is just like a, a service, kind of like a factory where you can create all those things. They, they, they run in parallel. You can choose whatever you want to, right? I personally like the form builder a little bit better, but let's take a look how that works. So the form builder basically is nothing else than here you can see the old style, how we can do it, uh, or the old style, like the first style we have seen, like newing things up, but I don't like to new things up. I personally love to, to inject the form builder. So the the form builder also gets provided by Angular Forms, and here you can see our template is not changing at all, right? So a template stays the same no matter how you create your forms in the background in your TypeScript file. But we can inject the form builder here, which is private FE, and this is the form builder, kind of like a, a factory or a service how we can create uh, form groups and um, form controls. And here we can say fb.group, you can also uh, say fb.control and stuff like that. So the form builders there, you can create forms with that as well. It's up to you what you use, right? My experience consistency is the key. So if you choose one way or the other, choose it and stay with it uh, during the whole project, this would be fine. But you can see that the form groups or the type does not change and the template also stays the same. It's up to you. I personally prefer that syntax, but it's completely up to you. I just um, have them here like side by side. So on the left hand side you can see uh, new and things up. On the right hand side we are using the form builder. I personally think it's a little bit uh, more clear. So the last kit in town is the form array. Let's talk about the form array. Um, surprise, surprise, the form array is an array of form controls, right? In comparison to the form group, this gets serialized not as an object, but as an array now. So if you want to iterate over controls more easily, maybe the form array is something for you. Um, I have honestly, I have to say, genuinely, I've never used it in projects that much because form group and form control were always fulfilling all my needs, right? So the form array, but it's there, right? It's for like dynamic controls. As we have seen, we can register controls in form groups as well, but sometimes in form array, like adding controls and removing them feels a little bit more like known if you're working with an array, like adding and removing stuff, right? Um, it's like you can better iterate over the controls, like I just said, and it's got serialized as an array. Let's take a look how that works, right? So first of all, um, what we're doing is we are having a form group and we're having a form array, both are public properties, and then we are um, creating a form array by the form builder dot array and inside of that we are placing a new form control and then this complete form array we are passing into the form group right so we have a group where's an array where's a control inside so in this we can now use in our template so we have a form and this form has a form group and then we can say diff with the form array name here right and then we are just binding our form array and then we can iterate over the controls and the inputs are like iterated and um, depending on how many inputs we add to our form array, right? So this would be like iterating over them. And I get uh, the question always in projects, can I make a component which like makes a form group reusable because I need it in different places? And that, yeah, that's totally possible. There are many ways. One of them is that you just create a component which has as an input like a form group, right? And what we can do is we can do a form group here, which is my form, again, a form array. And then inside of this form array, we are not adding a form control, but a form group, right? And then we have like the complete group where we add this particular array. And in the template then, we have like the same syntax. If somebody submits the form, we're calling a method. And then we are just iterating over the form array dot controls. And we're passing the form array controls, which are form groups inside of the component, which has an input property with a form group, which makes the whole form group reusable. Right, so that's totally possible. This is one way to solve it. Um, there are other ones, but yeah, this is um, this is one way which I really really like, which makes things really really simple. If you want to reuse forms inside of a component or reuse the components uh, which are displaying a form. Let's talk about validation because things are really, really getting interesting when we talk about validation. Validation is kind of like tell the user what has gone wrong with his inputs, right? Be as clear as possible. Tell the user what's wrong. Tell him why the phone number is not in the format you wanted to have. What is missing, 
right? Or the credit card number or an IBAN or something like that. This gets really, really um, expensive in terms of um, time you invest to make it as pretty as you can for the user, right? So the validation is also very interesting because Angular Soften in a very, very sexy way, in my opinion. Right? So we can, when we create this form, we can always pass the validators as a second argument when we are working with all the form controls. Right? So we are telling them, hey, um, I want to, first of all, import the validators. Angular has standard validators, which are brought to you by default, the out of the box there. And here, um, when we are creating the form, we can say the first name should be, n should be empty in the beginning, and we want to have the required validator on it. So that's it. That's the required validator on it, and now the form is automatically invalid if this thing is empty, right? So you don't have to do anything else concerning this. Angular comes with a lot of validators. Required is not the only one. So here we can see um, the validators required, but we also have like min, we have max, we have um, required, required true, the email, min length, max length, we have also the pattern null and stuff like that. So these are all coming out of the box and you can use them. And Angular takes care about disabling and enabling the form, the form control, the form group. It's always um, calculated and combined as you can use it and then the button it's disabled when my form is not valid, which is always uh, Angular takes care of that, right? So what happens in the background is that we know that our form control has an errors property, right? And if we add the required validator to it, Angular adds to that errors a property which is called required when you add the required validator on it. And you got the error, then the errors dot required is there, all right? If somebody types something in, the errors dot required is not there. It's not true and false. It's just there or not there. So the property required is on the errors if the error is there. And if the required is gone and the errors doesn't have the property required, then the form control basically is valid. And this is for all the other for all the other um, validators as well. We also have CSS classes where you can like um, just paint your inputs in a different way, which is like ng valid, ng invalid, and stuff like that. So Angular applies them automatically, and you can react to it in your CSS and make them look pretty. Right, but these are all built-in validators. Let's talk about custom validation a bit because things are really getting interested in uh, when we talk about custom validation, like I said, with the telephone numbers and stuff like that. So custom validators are nothing else than a normal class. We can completely extract them. So uh, from an architectural point of view, they're completely separated and just you can just hang them into your, into your forms, which, uh, which makes them uh, really, really good testable and stuff. Right? So we have a, a class, which is my custom validator, and it's um, just a return, it's taking, it's got a method, my validator, it's taken like an abstract control, and then we can check for the value, if, like, if the value is between one and 10 or something like that, and then we can either return an object with a property which has a value, in this case we are turning some prop um, is true, or we're returning null. So null means everything is okay. And s returning an object with some prop true, what Angular does is it takes the error property, of that particular control and adds the sum prop to that errors property. So my control dot errors dot sum prop is there and then you can show an error message uh, in the UI if you want to, right? So we have a normal class. This class has a my validator and um, then we're just taking the abstract control and um, we can do something with the value. And if the value is like fulfilling any error cases, we're returning the sum prop true, otherwise we're returning false. Right? So inside of a form group then, we don't want to use only the validators we have from Angular. We can also just chain our new validators. In this case, my custom validator dot my validator is a static, cl static class. And we're just passing the function, which Angular then feeds with the abstract control. See that we're not calling the method here. Right? We don't have the uh, parentheses that we are calling it because then we would have to pass the abstract control. Angular calls it at runtime right? and takes care about that. Let's talk about async validation a little bit, because like I just said, if you want to check if a user is there or not, you have to fire like an HTTP request or something, but async validation is basically just the same as we have just seen, right? It doesn't just 
um, it not only um, gives you back like an object, it gives you back an observable of the particular object you want to turn back. I just described this as any here. So we have, again, a class which is called my custom validator, and then we have a static method which is called my async validator. And again, Angular feeds it with the abstract control, and you can just fire your HTTP request, you can use NGRX, and then map the response and either return null or return an object which then gets added to the ARS property of that particular form control. And then you can check for it. Right, so that's asynchronous validation. This is the same principle if you want to check if a user is there, if an email address is, uh, is um, already taken and stuff like that. So in my opinion, that's very, very easy. It's always the same path for adding um, custom validation. You have to uh, pay attention to where we add it because this time we are not adding it to the, um, to the um, array as a, like, a second entry like you can see here. But what we are doing is we have a third entry where we are adding the um, async validators. So the first entry is always the default value the um, form control should have. The second one in the entry is with my synchronous validators and the third entry in the array are the async validators then, right? As you can see here. Angular calls them themselves, and like, like I said, fires to HTTP request. Pay attention not to fire an HTTP request every time the user types something because the, the validator is called, right? Pay attention to like doing a debounce time of, I don't know, 250 or 300 milliseconds because otherwise your, your backend will blow up if you, if you like search for every keystroke the user does, right? So uh, give, it a little, give it a little time, right? But sometimes you come to the, to the, um, to the place or the point where you want to um, validate controls which are related to each other. So you have a control there and a control there and you have a control here and you want to display this control or it should be active or inactive if this control one has a specific value in combination with that thing, right? So you have relations between all the controls and this is being called uh, cross-field validation in Angular. Right? So we can not can only validate one particular field, but multiple fields. Right? So if we're talking about cross-field validation, um, you can see that we have like um, the last name, we have the validators in here, but if we're talking about cross-field validation, we can't add a validator to a specific field, can we? Because we want to validate multiple fields. So we need something which knows about all the fields we have in the form, that it can check its value and then see if they are like being in that combination valid or not, right? And this, in that instance, is the form group. So we can pass that form group like a configuration object, and we can add the validators there. But remember, if we are adding validators here, all the errors we are throwing out of that particular validator is also added to the form group, because we're now at the form group level and not only on form control level, right? So now the form has errors because the form group uh, is implementing the abstract control, which got an errors property. So everything which we are returning from an um, AM cross field validator is added to the form group and not to particular controls. We can, however, but what we return is on the form group. This is a very, very, div a very, very important point. So, how does a cross field validator look? Right, we have a class again, which is my form validator, and then we have a static method which returns a validator function. Right? And that validator function, I like to use that pattern because then I can, I think, I can uh, um, pass values to, in, to it. And this um, function is only like a function which um, accepts a form group, which is an abstract control again. And inside of that form group or that abstract control, I can then check, give me my control one, give me my control two, are these values combined together, fulfilling everything I need, then it's okay or it's not okay. Right? So return null if everything is okay and um, otherwise an object. And if I do that pattern, you can see that I can also apply values to it, which makes them really reusable. Just think about you have like a drop down where you can just select some rooms and you have an input field where you can just type in some age and you want to check if with that age I can enter that room. Right? And the age can be a parameter which we can um, type in here or pass in here as a threshold. And then we can check is that room with that age being entered or not, if that is valid or not, right? So this makes it very, very easy for us. How does that look or how can that look basically? So now we have a value, we have a form group we are passing in, then we can just form group get 
um, like a form control name one, form control uh, control one name, control two name, and then we can check the values of it and uh, return if that is valid or not. The errors are getting to the form group and not to the form control, right? So you can see the form controls, and here we can see what we're returning. Let's talk about testing real quick, because we have seen that all of those things are really, really separated, and this is what I personally like about that, because testing really, really gets easy. So if I just want to test something, um, I can just test my validator. I can do a describe, uh, should return valid if uh, the value is empty. So what I'm doing is I'm just newing up a new form control. I'm setting the value to an empty string. So I'm passing it inside of my validator, and I'm checking if everything is all right. This saved my ass a lot of times in projects when I could like just test validators and see if they're behaving good or not, right? So this is a really, really mighty experience. So also cross-field validation is also being tested very well. So what we can do is we can take our validator function, pay attention that we have a function now, right? So we're returning a function, Angular calls it by themselves, but if you're passing a threshold, we get back a function. We can create a new form grab with, um, with form controls and then pass that form group into the validator function, get a result, and check if that result is okay or not, right? So we jump over the next test because that's basically the same. Um, what I also want to um, pay attention to or what I want to tell you is the value change, the rich API I mentioned earlier. So the value changes is uh, really, really powerful if you want to see if something changes either in my form group or in my form array or in my form control. So again, at the example, when you're doing like a search or something or an autocomplete, you can always listen to if something changes, I want to do something. It doesn't have to go over a validator. You can also um, subscribe to the value change and say, if my form group, my company complete form group changes something, I want to do something else, right? But please not do validation in this. Validation has another way of implementing it as we have just seen it, right? This is just if you want to do anything else, um, like uh, telling the user what autocomplete things uh, he can choose or something like that, right? So the value changes is for the complete form group in this case, or you get a control first, and then you can um, register or subscribe to the value changes of that particular control. Everything is possible. Right. Let's talk about Angular 14 and, and the next version of Angular, because I know if you heard of it, but Angular introduces the type forms. Everything we have seen so far is always the type any. We don't know that in a particular form control there is a string in it. We don't know if there's a number in it, but Angular added the new type forms in it. So the Angular 14 RC1, I think you can you can try it out. It's baked in there, but with Angular 14, when it's released finally, it will be in there. So these are the type forms. This is on GitHub. You can follow the discussion, um, which is very, very interesting. They also um, provided the way how they got there, where they are now. I just provide a QR code, which you can scan in the slides later. How I said, I provided them, or I will provide them over Twitter. It's not a problem. So let's take a look at that form. We have a profile component with a profile form. We new things up, have a new form group. And um, we say profile form controls, first name, and then set the value 5. And the value 5 is a problem because the first name on line 3 is a string. And we're setting the 5 in it, which is basically not a string, right? So this was possible in the old days. In the new days, now with Angular 14 and type forms, Angular will check that this John is a string, right? And you can't pass a 5 in there. So argument of type 5 is not assignable to parameter of type um, string or null. Not it has to be because when you reset, it's, it's set to not, right? So what we are doing here is you can pass the type for the form here. So we can say that the profile form is a new form group and it has a type of first name, which is a form control of string or null, and last name of form control um, string or null again. And then it is possible to add the two in there, down there, and then uh, Angular checks the string is a string that matches, and this is totally fine. So it, it really, really saves you from errors, and you can't overwrite um, things inside of your form with the wrong type, which is really, really powerful. What also does not work if you're doing the first time a first name with a new form control with a five, basically, because five, again, is not a string and doesn't match the type you have given there. Right? If you have existing forms inside of your current project, Angular offers you a migration path. 
right? So they are getting migrated if you update to the new Angular version. If you update from 13 to 14 or something, it's, 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 it's being done automatically for you. I have a link here, a QR code for the link as well for the complete migration part. However, what you can do is ng update Angular core next and then you will get the next version. You can do it right now. It's RC1, I think. It's 14 RC1. I tried it this morning. It works very well. So you do um, Angular slash core dash dash next, and you get the latest version of Angular. What you also can do is if you only want to run the migrations for your particular forms, you can do an Angular update uh, core and then dash dash migrate only um, migrate for V14 typed forms, and then it will be upgraded or migrated for you automatically. What will they migrate? So let's refer to that form again. So we have, a, or let's, um, let's take a look at that form. We have a form controller, a form group, a form array, and a form builder. And what they will introduce is an untyped form control, untyped form group, untyped form array. So you can search for it in your um, solution. This is backwards compatible. Everything should work as normal, but you're on an untyped path now. And what you can do now is you can search, um, search for them and add types if you want to. So if we're taking a look at the profile component, at the profile form, we have a form group after the migration. This is an uh, untyped form group, an untyped form control. Um, like we have seen here, and you can add the any, or implicit, there is an any added to it. If you hover with the mouse over it, you can see that there is an any. If you just get rid of that any and use a normal form group now in V14, and I hovered with the mouse over it, and I hope you can see it, Angular adds the type automatically for it. Right? So it sees if you have a last name and there is a John, and a first, uh, first name there's a John, and the last name there's Doe, um, it adds automatically that this is a form control of type string or null in the background, right? So you can add the types if you want to, but they are now typed implicitly for you, so you don't can do any mistakes when setting value into the form, which is a huge, huge win, and this was wanted for a long, long time. Right. For the last few minutes, I would like to refer to custom form controls, which is one of another possibility to reuse form things, which you have to do over and over again in, uh, inside of your project, like that particular block buttons, like uh, medium size, large and small. You want to have it inside of your forms all over the place. So you can reuse them. This is custom form controls. How do they look? They look like a normal form control, but this time it's not an input, but it's app block buttons. So you wrap a form control, which is uh, specific to your needs in your project, and you can reuse it, and it just slides into your form group um, or your form controls as you know it from a normal form control, right? So here you can just combine those things, like the three buttons or whatever you want to like combine together. All, everything you have to do is you have to implement a control value accessor, and the control value accessor makes you implement uh, those four methods, write value, register and change, register and touch, and uh, set disabled state, and then you have like a component which you can reuse inside of your forms. The only thing you have to do is you have to extend the ng value accessor. Uh, it should use the existing inside of your your component and multi true because we don't want to overwrite something. And if it's not instantiated yet, use the existing. This is why we're using the forward ref. So please register it when this thing gets instantiated because Webpack sometimes has some timing problems there. Right. So this is very important. And then you can reuse your custom form controls everywhere, everywhere you want to and can treat it like a normal form control, which gets seamless into your form group. Let's do a small recap. What have we seen so far? We have seen the form group, the form control, and the form array, which are the building blocks of reactive forms. We have seen the form builder in comparison to newing everything up. We have seen the validation, which is very, very powerful. Uh, we have seen the testing gets really, really easy. We have seen the rich API with the values changes and the status changes and stuff like that. We have seen custom form controls, and we have seen how Angular forms are working in the future. They are type safe. And in this case, I just can say thank you very much. If you could, any questions, please hit me up in the hallway. That's no problem. And uh, stay safe and enjoy the conference. Thank you very much.